Hi, good evening. My name is Dara Morgan, and I'm the violinist in the Fidelio Trio. And we would like to welcome you to our eighth Fidelio Trio Winter Chamber Music Festival, brought to you this year virtually, as unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we can't be in Dublin at our lovely Dublin home in Belvedere House in St. Patrick's College, Dublin City University. First of all, I'd like to make some thanks. I'd like to thank, of course, the Arts Council of Ireland and all our other supporters, the RVW Trust for commissioning the Robert Saxton New Trio, and of course our festival partners, Glass Drum and CMC, the Contemporary Music Centre. The first piece you're going to hear tonight is by Joan Trimble, the wonderful Irish composer. Joan wrote this piece in 1940 when she was studying at the Royal College of Music in London, and it was written for what was then called the Cobbett Prize, a fantasy competition um, piece of music that you had to write there. It's an incredible piece of music, beautifully lyrical, has something of an Irish jig in the middle. And I always think of Bill Evans, who was active around this time in the 40s and 50s with Miles Davis. You can nearly hear some Bill Evans chords in the middle. And then there's this incredible, almost Debussy-like evocative moment of La Mer that hints towards the end in the last piano chords. This is Joan Trimble's Fancy Trio.
Hi, my name's Tim Gill, and I'm the cellist of the Fidelio Piano Trio. I'm delighted I was able to join these wonderful musicians. Um, quite recently, actually, I joined them uh, back in just before lockdown, I think. So the next piece you're going to hear is also by Joan Trimble. Um, it's uh, a, a little arrangement of uh, an Irish folk tune, which I'm sure many of you will recognize, called the Coolin. And um, there have been many arrangements of this particular song. Uh, perhaps one of the most famous ones was by Samuel Barber, um, which was arranged a, a few years after Joan Trimble arranged hers. Uh, this is a very simple uh, setting of a very familiar tune and uh, I hope you enjoy it. So 
here we are today. Robert, it's great to have you and to record virtually for our festival in Dublin your amazing fantasy pieces. I thought I'd start by asking you a little bit about fantasy in general. It's a terminology we know well in the music world. Um, and looking back, I suppose, to the compositions of particular Brahms and Schumann, um, is there anything in particular about fantasia or that word fantasy that immediately allures you towards the type of writing that you made in this piece or the dream-like quality of fantasies? They make any sense to you in that way? Yeah, that's a very pertinent and interesting question because I used the term fantasia with a Z as Purcell did for a piece many years ago in the 1990s which was um, modelled on the idea of the personal fantasias, of course, in the 17th century. And, of course, the English fancy or fantasia was a, a very definite genre. But it changed, obviously, over the centuries. And in the 19th century, as you've pointed out, with particularly, say, Schumann, um, who's one of my absolute idols, one has this idea of something that is... Um, not only just musing, but is also the possibility, the great fantasy for piano, of different characters, almost like a novel. And um, it can be to do with myths and dreaming and even dance and song. And so when I wrote this piece for you, um, I was thinking of um, intimate chamber music, but which was also... Um, full of changes of character in linked movements like the Schumann sets of piano pieces, Carnival and Papillon, etc. And I think one of the things I wanted to do um, was to write um, uh, pieces that were in some senses outward looking and virtuosic and yet at the same time um, were able to have a, a sort of inner life but for you um, as, a, as a group. So it's really interesting you mention, you know, of course, if a listener hears these pieces in a minute, they mightn't instantly put the word dream next to them. But mm. there is something myth-like in uh, not just the fact that each movement is attacker, we go straight into the next, yes. but uh, the character of each is so contrasting and yet... There's this great line through all of the music. I mean, was there something of a dreamlike quality in any of the music that you were making? Yes. I, a, a lot of my music, and particularly this piece, is to me about a journey. It's a voyage. So at the end, when it, it fades out, it's almost as if it could go round and begin again. Don't worry, you don't have to play it twice. <laughs> and, and the thing is that um, I, didn't, I did toy with giving the movements titles afterwards and suggestive of how to of not how to play it because you know how to play it better than I know, do but um, I didn't because I wanted the listener and also you as the players to have your own ideas so uh, as music is non-specific um, I decided to let the each one is almost like a poem there's some great but suggestive near titles in them, I think, like the Confuco of the, with the fire of the third movement or the whispering quality that you're looking for at the beginning of the fourth movement or even yes. at the very end in yes. the fast section of the last movement where you go dance-like. I mean, they're all very clear but strong evocative titles. It's interesting you say it because the very opening where the piano is playing these scales and arpeggios and you and the cello begin with harmonics and then gradually develop a more solid line which is almost one line split into two. Um, that is definitely begins as if you're perhaps musing. You know, perhaps you're half asleep in an armchair and gradually you hear this music emerging from nowhere. In fact, it's interesting that Wagner said that the prelude to Rheingold, which he thought of and wrote last, came to him after lunch when he was half asleep. Dozing. Well, mm. talking a little further about the idea of writing for a piano trio, I'm always intrigued uh, every time we have a new work written for the trio. Yes. And we're very lucky to have so many uh, composers writing and have written for us over the years, but I'm always interested, uh, it's such a personal thing. Um, 
Did writing for the Tria present any Im immediate challenges or was it, did it feel incredibly natural to you? I know it's uh, got such a legacy of, you know, mm. repertoire going back right to Haydn and of mm. course that whole question early in the classical genre of what do we do with the left hand of the piano and the cello and then, you know, through the Brahms and the Mendelssohn trios and yes. then of course more recently, um, Ravel even, was there anything in particular that you were not even concerned about but that you were aware of to take into account or did it just become, become very naturally writing for this combination? That is an incredibly relevant question to me because first of all it, at one level it felt very natural. I'd wanted to write this piece for many years and I was so grateful to you when you agreed to take it on. <laughs> So that was fulfilling my fantasy. <laughs> but the other more technical side, as you say, was uh, very much, I'm very aware of the tradition for, of uh, the original um, technical side with Haydn, where the cello is mostly doubling the left hand of the piano. And of course, we know we're living in a very different age. And if I'd written this piece perhaps 40 years ago, near the start of my composition career, I would probably have not thought of that as such a problem because I would just have written for three instruments. But because I've been working for many years and worked, it took me many years to work towards the sort of modal counterpoint that I've developed, um, I had to think very carefully about what the lower region um, areas of the harmony were doing. It doesn't use root progressions in a classical sense, but so the texture and the harmonic resonance in relation to what the cello was doing, in relation to the left hand of the piano, was a very, very big issue. It was a problem in a positive sense, like a, a mathematician will have a problem to be solved. Um, that was all the time in my mind, and particularly perhaps in the um, fourth movement with the, where the ensemble becomes one as a, and playing arpeggios, slowly changing background harmony. Um, who was playing the bass note and even what, what the violin was playing in terms of which part of the middle of the texture and the harmony. So that's, yeah, absolutely was on in my mind the whole time. Well, you certainly answered those problems as far as we're concerned. Um, Robert, it's a pleasure to play this piece. I think I first met your music when I came to the Guildhall in 1992, which is it's good 28 years ago now, so it's wonderful to premiere this piece. I'm sorry we can't be in Dublin, but we toast you anyway in the best truest Irish way. And let's listen now to your fancy pieces, the world premiere recording. Well, thank you for letting me write it and for including it in your festival. Thank you. Thank you.